and so it took a long to, time. Just to get this right, you were actually working today on an exercise that envisioned yes. virtually this scenario. Uh, almost precisely. I was up until 2 o'clock this morning because it, it's our job, my own company, Visor Consultants, we specialize in helping people to get their crisis management response. How do you jump from slow time thinking to quick time doing? And we chose a scenario with their assistance which is based on a terrorist attack because they're very close to uh, a property occupied by Jewish businessmen. They're in the city and there are more American banks in the city than there are in the whole of New York. A logical thing to do. And it, I've still so got how, the... I was going to say, how extraordinary today <laughs> must feel for you as, as it unfolds. He repeated himself to BBC Radio 5. Uh, the thing that concerns me is that what are we doing for the thousands of men and women actually who are in London working? And I say that because at half past nine this morning we were actually running an exercise for a, over a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my legs standing upright. To so get this quite straight, you were running uh, a, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this and it happened while you were running the exercise. Precisely. And it was uh, about half past nine this morning. We planned this for a company and for obvious reasons. I don't want to reveal their name, but if they're listening, they'll know it. And we had a room full of crisis managers for the first time they met and so within five minutes we made a pretty rapid decision, this is the real one. Uh, and so we went through the correct, the correct drills of activating crisis management procedures to jump from slow time to quick time thinking yeah. and so on. If we use a standard actuary employed by major insurance companies to calculate the probability of these events coinciding in a 10-year meme, we learn that the probability of this happening is greater than 1 in 300 tretagillion. To put that in perspective, that's a number with 41 zeros behind it. That is trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and still more trillions times greater than all the grains of sand in all the world. To put that number in perspective, it has 41 zeros. Scientists using supercomputers have estimated that the Earth has over 7 quatillion grains of sand. A quatillion has 18 zeros. It would appear as some way of stopping the response of the emergency services or providing some kind of cover for what must be operations orchestrated in some way by the state. The evidence is overwhelming. All the telltale signs are there of government-sponsored terror. Only the British government had the know-how to carry out the attacks and to control the situation before and after the bombings. And of course, there's all the other admitted cases where the British government has hired terrorists to carry out assassinations or carried out bombings in their own country as a pretext for political control. And then, of course, there's Ki Bono, Latin for who benefits, who stands to gain. In the weeks leading up to 7-7, Tony Blair's poll numbers had fallen to the lowest point in his seven-year administration. Blair came an inch from losing control of the parliament and was fighting calls from within his own party to step down as prime minister. Support for the war was dismal. Despite the bombings, which did improve his approval ratings and support for the war, he was still only barely able to maintain control over the British House of Commons. In the wake of the bombings, Tony Blair's administration descended on the British people with a raft of tyrannical legislation attacking the press, freedom of assembly, and setting up the conditions needed for a martial law takeover of the nation through the Civil Contingencies Act. And of course the bombings took place while world leaders were meeting in Scotland so Bush and Blair could grandstand and blame the whole thing on Iraq, legitimizing their war. Despite the fact that the G8 World Summit was coming to England on July 7th, the British government lowered the terror threat on the London Underground in early June and conveniently lowered security. We were told that we invaded Iraq to bring the nation freedom, but Pentagon documents show their real plan was to balkanize the nation into three or four sections and foment endless sectarian civil war. The true objective was to ensure the nation remained in turmoil as a pretext to build permanent military bases, as well as delivering long-term profits to defense contractors. Think about it. Do defense contractors make more money if they were just in Iraq a year? or now the projected decade. 
United States, British, and Israeli forces have all been caught repeatedly carrying out staged terror attacks in Iraq in an attempt to keep the war going. In the interest of time, we'll look at just one example. In late September of 2005, in the British-controlled city of Basra, two British Special Forces SAS commandos attacked a group of police at a checkpoint, killing one and injuring another. When they were finally subdued and brought into custody, their car was filled with plastic explosives, automatic weapons, rocket-propelled grenades, and other bomb-making materials. Why would members of Britain's most elite fighting force, the Special Air Services, be dressed up like Arabs out shooting police with a car full of plastic explosives in a city that had been racked by sectarian violence? The governor of Basra in Iraq ordered that the British soldiers be held for trial for the murder they'd committed. Within hours of their incarceration, dozens of British tanks and hundreds of soldiers assaulted the main police station in Basra, killing jail guards and police in the process to free the two commandos. Over 150 prisoners escaped, and the controlled mainstream media reported on the incident as if it was no big deal. We cannot wait for the final proof. A smoking gun it could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein already possesses two out of the three key components needed to build a nuclear bomb. In early February of 2006, members of the British government leaked documents that the White House admits are authentic. Known as the White House Memo, it is the minutes of a pre-war meeting between Prime Minister Tony Blair and George Bush in the Oval Office. The minutes contain the discussion of a classic false flag operation, where Bush tried to lure Saddam into war using UN aircraft. Mr. Bush told Tony Blair of the extraordinary plan during a meeting in the White House on January 31, 2003, six weeks before the war started, the Times of London reported. The Times reads, President Bush had plans to lure Saddam Hussein into war by flying an aircraft over Iraq painted in UN colors in a hope he would shoot it down. The memo also contained details of President Bush's plan to have defectors claim they had seen weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. Uh, well, it is perfectly true that we now know that the evidence both in the United States and in Britain, which was put before the people, uh, turns out to be wrong. It was known to be wrong. Uh, it was fed. Uh, to Parliament, uh, it was uh, fed to Congress in order to get uh, the necessary support. But we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. When Congress threatened to block the reauthorization and expansion of the USA Patriot Act in 2006, President Bush announced that he would still enforce the law even if it was not a law. That by its definition is dictatorship. When President Bush was caught secretly paying off reporters and newspapers and television stations across the country to the tune of $1.6 billion in two years, the Governmental Accounting Office declared it illegal. Every single action by itself was a felony, and there were tens of thousands of instances. President Bush simply said that he was above the law, and it didn't matter if Congress said it was illegal, he was going to continue the practice. When a leader declares themselves above the law, you are living in an official dictatorship. We have found out from our time in the services that there are certain people in the press who work as agents of influence of the intelligence services. In Britain, it's very easy to reward people with privileges, with contracts, with honours, with appointments to the House of Lords, with knighthoods and so on. So no money has to change hands, but those people know very clearly that they have a job to put out propaganda on behalf of the services. Now, I have no problem, of course, with the services arguing their case in the media, but if they're going to do that, like anybody else, they should declare where they come from and why they're stating that point of view. Fortunately, as a result of our book, Spies, Lies and Whistleblowers, uh, one of the prominent agents of influence, in fact, two prominent agents of influence, Dominic Lawson and Con Coughlin, who both worked for the Sunday Telegraph, have had to resign. Because, of course, once you're exposed as an agent of influence, you can no longer do that job because people just simply say, well, he's saying that because he's working to an M1. 